should come any second. 80 miles an hour. I'm on. Good morning, friends. We are glad you are here to worship with us on this Palm Sunday. It is uh, not quite the end of Lent, not quite the beginning of Easter. It is the beginning of Holy Week, this transition time from the time of uh, inward looking into how our spiritual journeys are going and what changes we can make. And also, we travel with Jesus from uh, as he enters Jerusalem today and moves towards the cross this week. We are glad you are here at the beginning. We hope you are here at the end as well. Friends, let us gather now our hearts and our spirits and our thoughts as we praise God together. Rise as you are able for the call to worship this day. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
You may be seated. Good morning, my friends. It's a different order today. Did I surprise you by making you sit down? I'd like to invite the kids to come forward, if they would, please. Come quickly. Come quickly. We have something very special today. You want to sit right over there, Charlotte? Thank you. Well, as you all came in this morning, you were handed a wonderful... It's because it's Palm Sunday. And we start the story of Jesus as he enters the town. This is Holy Week, as Pastor Jody reminded us. And this is as Jesus is entering the town. Have you all ever been to a parade? Yeah. Yeah? Have you been to a parade? Do you remember sitting on the side of the street waiting for the parade to come? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did it seem like you were waiting forever? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How about you all? Have you ever anticipated something and felt like it was taking forever? Well, I can only imagine the people of that town. They've waited a long time for a king to come. And so as Jesus was entering that town, I am sure they were like standing on the side on their tiptoes waiting to see him. And they were waving palm branches or branches of just lots of different trees, I'm sure. And they were shouting a special word. A lot of the people were shouting. Does anybody ever know that word? Hosanna. Hosanna. Everybody shout it together. Hosanna. Yes. And that means, Jesus, save us. Save us now. So today, as we sing our first hymn, we're going to parade around and we're going to wave our palm branches high. You are going to sing loudly as we usher Jesus into the town. And while you're singing loudly, do you hear the word loudly? You are going to wave your palm branches. Let us celebrate as we begin Holy Week. Let us stand.
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Our old selves were crucified with him so that we might be slaves to sin no more. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. O oh Lord our God, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity. But we find ourselves distracted by our own desires. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we are satisfied with injustice and discord. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Turn us to your will by the power of your spirit so that all may know your justice and peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. Therefore, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us sing to the glory of God. Glory to God. If you are heading to Children's Church, I'll meet you in the back.
want to thank the Bells for uh, playing today, the Bells of Grace. There's a, a lot of practice, of course, that goes into preparation for this, just like the choir. And then they come on Wednesday and set up the tables. We have to confer the week ahead to make sure we're putting the tables in just the right place. You know, we've got to move everything into place, make it just so decent and in order as we are. So we thank you for your patience as we uh, move things around from time to time here and uh, things look a little different. And that's a good thing because we are not created to be static creatures, but creatures who are always changing and giving glory to God in new ways. So thanks to the Bells uh, for their diligent work today in helping us welcome the Lord. Our first scripture lesson comes to us from Psalm 118. Let's listen now for God's word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now moving to our gospel lesson, it comes to us from Matthew chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever reinvented yourself? Or maybe you just want to. What would that look like? Did an internet search for reinvent yourself and what comes up is legions of self-help advice from life and career coaches, as you might expect. Interestingly, uh, many pastors and religious leaders have reinvented themselves by becoming life coaches and spiritual directors, whether full-time or on the side while they serve in a congregation or other context. Many of these uh, web pages, blog posts, and articles that pop up uh, advising how to reinvent oneself list the steps you have to take. And frequently they mention things like the following. Assess where you have been. Determine what really matters to you. Write down a plan. Start small and build momentum. Ask for help or advice. Make a concerted effort to change old habits and or add new ones. Expect failures or hiccups on the way and reassess as needed. 
Though it is not particularly focused on reinvention, there's a local media outlet called Growing Boulder. Have you heard of them at all? They have a small presence on various media, but they frequently inspire folks through their stories of older folks who are doing things that don't fit the ageist stereotype. Uh, Recently, I saw a story of an 88-year-old woman who holds like 35 world records in track and field. She's doing all of the things that Bruce Jenner did in the 70s, the decathlon-type events, and uh, it seems that no one is going to challenge her. I probably couldn't do half the things that she's doing. So it's it's that kind of thing. Not exclusively folks that old, but definitely skewing uh, over 40 and above. Growing Boulder itself is a reinvention of sorts, as it was started by Orlando television journalists who transitioned from the fast-paced world of so-called breaking news to something slower, more thoughtful, and ultimately more useful. Karen Merrick, a self-described serial entrepreneur, is a business advisor, speaker, and writer. She says, here's the thing about reinvention. Some believe it's tossing out the old, your previous roles, experiences, and even work identity, and exchanging it for something completely new. That's not accurate. Instead, the best power of reinvention lies in leveraging everything you've ever done, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the successes and failures. It taps into the very real and often unappreciated and unarticulated skills insights and experience, or expertise rather, that you have gained along the way. So you don't need to try to create a new personality from scratch to reinvent yourself. And whatever the motivation, it's essential that we continue to grow and change in big or small ways, one day at a time. Today is the last message in our Lenten series, Henri Matisse and the Colors of Lent, We will still play with the artistic theme for Easter Sunday, but that will be a little bit different. We have been walking through this time of uh, penitent self-reflection in a gentler way than we often find in Lenten practices of self-discipline, by using the works of one artist to shed light on our spiritual journey together. Our goal is to reinvent our way of sensing the world. Though the focus so far has been on the wondrous colors and innovative compositions of visual art, I hope that this discipline will cover your other senses going forward. Pay attention not only to the rainbow of colors around you, but also take note of the surprising textures that your hands and feet touch. Breathe in deeply when you smell enticing aromas. Pause to listen to new sounds and let them send your creative mind to wandering. Taste some new foods that might surprise you at how delicious they are. By engaging the senses, perhaps you will already be on the road to reinvention. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus is on a road, though I would not describe it exactly as a road to reinvention. He knew exactly what he was up to. He knew that his ministerial journey was reaching its completion. What had to be reinvented was the expectations of those who welcomed him to Jerusalem with loud hosannas, waving of palms, and spreading cloaks along the way. They had no idea that Jesus was not the Messiah they were expecting, a military conqueror, a leader of armed resistance who would, by the power of God, overthrow their oppressors. This is what the people were expecting. And in a way, Jesus played along by entering town on a donkey. As Matthew says, this was to fulfill the words of the prophet. In this case, Zechariah, who wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Those were the words of our call to worship today. The crowd's response was telling, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting from the psalm that we read, Psalm 118. 
The verse before, verse 26, says, Save us, which is what Hosanna means, as Cheryl pointed out. So as the devotional writer of Henri Matisse in the Colors of Lent has described the scene in an accompanying podcast, what transpired was an elaborate piece of street theater, a spontaneous embodied remembrance of Scripture. In our time, think of places where we reenact scriptural scenes, like passion plays this time of year. Sometimes churches will hold a living last supper on Maundy Thursday. And going back to Christmas, think of all the living nativity scenes that churches hold. Personally, I'm glad we stick to reenacting these stories and scenes instead of things we see, for example, in Revelation. That's what the people of Jerusalem were doing in response to Jesus entering as he did on a donkey. They knew their scriptures as well as he did. They even referenced a fleeting scene in 2 Kings when the prophet Elisha sent another prophet in his entourage to Jehu, a military commander. Elisha said that God wanted Jehu to be anointed as king. He sent this other prophet with instructions to anoint Jehu quickly and secretly so as not to alert Ahab, the current king, who would be struck down. When Jehu emerged onto the steps where he had been meeting with other military commanders in council to let them know what had happened, they spread their cloaks on the steps as a sign of deference to the new king. The people of Jerusalem, or at least the outside the gates, their response in this scene was pretty impressive, if you think about it. No one knew exactly when Jesus was arriving, and they certainly didn't expect such a prophetic entrance. Yet, they saw in his method the secret code of their scripture, and they responded with their own coded sign of deference to authority and praise to the Lord. Yet, all through this elaborate, improvisational, collective remembrance, Jesus was up to something new. He was leading the people towards reinvention of their faith tradition. He was inaugurating a new kingdom, yes, but one that was destined to be more expansive, liberating, and subversive than they ever supposed possible. And paradoxically, the road to that reinvention of God's reign led straight to humiliation, degradation, violence, and despair. The hill of Golgotha, the place of the skull. Sometimes the need for reinvention is self-discovered. We find ourselves restless and unsatisfied. Other times, unexpected life changes force decisions leading to reinvention upon us. The Colors of Lent devotional mentions one such forced reinvention. It says, toward the end of his life, Matisse's health didn't allow him to paint as he had before. He was forced to spend most of his time in a wheelchair or in bed. But Matisse refused to stop making art. Instead, he began painting with scissors, as he put it, cutting paper into fantastic, beautiful shapes. The same bright colors and joyful style, now on an even bigger scale, including murals that covered entire walls. These cutouts turned out to be the last major chapter of Matisse's career as an artist. And it was also one of the most creative, productive chapters of them all. He called this period his second life. In the midst of a wilderness of illness, pain, and confinement, Matisse found a new way to experience freedom, refusing to give up hope for the future. I have a couple of images to show you of this new cutout method. Both come from a portfolio of 20 cutouts that he collectively called Jazz, completed in 1947. This first one you see here, notice it's a whole page that is cut out there, and you're seeing one side of it. This is called Icarus, a stylistic depiction of the Greek myth of the character who flew too close to the sun, 
melting the wax in his fabricated wings. You can move on to the next one, Noah. The second one is called Horse, Rider, and Clown. The horse head is apparent, but no human figure is seen, only imagined wearing the black and white robe. Likewise, no clown is obviously pictured, only hinted at in the opposite corner from the rider, wearing a costume of black and yellow and green. The ringmaster's whip flows through the middle of this piece as if caught in the moment before the loud snap it will make. Many of the cutouts in the jazz portfolio have circus-related images. And certainly this piece was not intended as a depiction of Palm Sunday. But as Matisse was moving into a period of abstract expressionist art like this, it provides freedom of interpretation. And perhaps it should lead us to ask, if Jesus is the writer in this image and the whip portends his passion, then who is the clown? Could it be the crowds who were so quick to improvise street theater with Jesus on Sunday, only to mock and jeer at him by Friday? Could it be us, too, so quick to make a mockery of his example through our own willful disobedience and convenient discarding of his teaching? We can see Lent as a great time of reinvention in our walk with Jesus. What colors do we notice in this journey? The green of the palm fronds, the brown of the donkey, the golden dust, the earth tones of the clothing. What do we hear? Loud shouts of, save us, affirmations of blessedness, the commotion of people climbing on rooftops to get a better view. Perhaps vessels of produce topple in the confusion, spilling their contents in the lane and causing the donkey to bray. What do we smell? Dare I ask? I'll leave that question to you. Likewise with taste, though perhaps those were dates that spilled, and as a passive observer, you pick one up, dust it off, and take a bite. Finally, what do we touch? After tasting the date, do we pick up the basket or pot from which it fell? Maybe we feel a fresh cut from the palm fronds needles. Our feet shift in our sandals as we crane our necks to get a better view of the procession. And the sand between our toes reminds us of the dryness of the air. Together, our senses inform, but they do not complete they do help us, if we pay attention to them, to access our artistic sense. Through our creative side, no matter how small or large it might be, we dream of reinvention. What obstacles have we put in our way that prevents change for the better? Pride? Envy? Skepticism? Greed? We should be better prepared than the people of Jerusalem were 2,000 years ago. We have all the hindsight, all the theology, all the experience of what not to do when it comes to following Jesus. Why does it seem we are no better off now? It's tempting to think that sin is sin and we have no more hope now than folks did in that time and place. But that's a cop-out, an easy exit ramp from the road to Golgotha. If we call ourselves disciples, we should follow Jesus all the way to the cross, if not on it. There's no denying that one of the colors of reinvention is red. We remind ourselves of that uncomfortable truth as we come to this table today. In this, the beginning of Holy Week, this table becomes more real more somber than usual. We are acutely aware of the weight of Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me. The table is not a place of dread, but it is a place of weight, of burden, of responsibility. Not ours, 
but his. God, through his son, was reinventing God's own self, both at the beginning of Jesus' life and at the end. The colors of reinvention then are the brown of the bread and the red of the wine. As we enact scripture today at the table of the Lord, may it be a vessel of our spiritual reinvention. May it be more than mere theater. May it change our lives and force us to create beauty in ways we never anticipated. Amen. I ask you to rise as you are able as we affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed, a little longer than the Apostles' Creed, so pay attention. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We come to this table. All are invited. Bring whatever colors are on your mind, whatever colors you are wearing, whatever colors you love. Know that as you take the bread and drink the cup, you will be suffused with new colors, colors that will reinvent you too. In this service, we come forward uh, row by row, and we take the bread and the cup while we are here. We return to our seats. And uh, we will take the bread as one and take the cup as one as well. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us in this space, in this time of great praise, and this time of beginning of Holy Week. It's the biggest time of the year, God, and uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure everything is just so, that we celebrate appropriately, that no egg is left unturned, that we come to worship with our palms in hand today, and next week wearing our best. We want to make sure we get it just right. But God, you have shown us that it's not always just right, the way things happen in the world. You sent your Son to live among us to show us that even when we fail, we look to him for not only forgiveness but restoration and reinvention. We give you thanks for the example that he continues to show us to this day. We give you thanks for this table and the elements prepared. We give you thanks for those who have baked this bread and made this juice. We give you thanks for those who behind the scenes this morning have prepared these elements so that we might receive them and remember well. We ask your blessings on all of those friends who are at home, unable to make it today to this space. 
whether because of age or frailty or some other obligation. We ask that as they remember, too, that they will be strengthened for service in Jesus' name. We give you thanks that you are ever-present with us, not only in this bread and cup, but through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the word preached, through the fellowship that we lend one another, through our visits in times of sickness and need, you demonstrate your power. We give you thanks and we pray that great prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this and remember me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and pouring it out, he said, This cup is the new covenant, shed for my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink and remember me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. You may come forward row by row as you would like. Front rows first. Friends, the body of Christ. The cup of the Lord. Let us pray. God, this meal reminds us of our obligations, our responsibilities. 
just as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem with those same obligations and responsibilities, not doing them simply because he had to. He was conflicted, but also he knew that his purpose was one of glory and honor to you. May all that we do, no matter how difficult, as long as it is holy and right and just and gives you glory, may we do it with much strength as we can handle. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, you may rise for that. I don't need to tell you, this is going to be a busy week. It's Holy Week. We have uh, the um, uh, Small Blessings kids. Uh, if you are available at 9.30 on Wednesday morning, they do hops for Haiti. So if you haven't signed up to be a hop counter, Carol Mano is your contact for that. And uh, they, they hop as many as they can to raise money for our friends at Good Shepherd School in Haiti. And uh, Thursday, of course, we have uh, soup in um, Conway Hall ahead of our Monday Thursday service, 6 p.m. there, 6.30 here, and that's Thursday. Friday is the Community Good Friday service at Park Lake Presbyterian Church at noon, and um, I will be giving a short message in that, but really there's many pastors that are involved in that um, solemn remembrance of Jesus' last day. And uh, I took the wrong piece of paper. Helps to have the right one. Five cents per meal. You know, in all the pomp and circumstance, we almost forgot to lift that up today. So you will notice in the back that we have some collection buckets ready. They're on the little stands with the white tablecloths on them. Two back here, one in the narthex. So um, if you can spare some change for our folks who are doing important feeding ministry work through Central Florida Presbytery, we appreciate your ability to help with that. We also have a special uh, offering that we're receiving called One Great Hour of Sharing next Sunday. So there'll be special envelopes set aside for that. Easter sunrise service, 7 a.m., right back there. Not in the sanctuary, outside of it. So it's going to be on the front lawn. And then our regular services at 845 and 1045 in this space. Friends, I know that's a lot. That's what we're called to do, a lot. 
We hope that we do it together joyfully, bringing all the colors of our experience together so that we may paint uh, a stunning portrait that would be pleasing to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.